Tonight's lecture is dead, not dead, but sleepeth. I shouldn't say dead. Um, <laughs> not dead. Uh, Doug Klaus owns a graphic design business in New York City with Angela Vulangas called the Graphics Office. In 2007, he com completed a graduate degree at the Bard Graduate Center, where he focused on the history of graphic design. His research resulted in the publication of two books on design history, The Handy Book of Artistic Printing, which he did with Angela, and McKellar, Smiths, and Jordan. Uh, or that's not what it's called, but that's what it's about. Um, <laughs> what's, it, what's it called? He'll tell you. Um, since 2007, he has taught graphic design studio and history classes at Purchase College, School of Visual Arts, and the Fashion Institute of Technology. From 2010 to early 2011, he was curator, printer, and designer at Bound & Co. Stationers at the Seaport Museum, New York, in Lower Manhattan. Please welcome Doug Klaus. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Kara, and uh, thanks to Cooper Union for having me here again. It's really great to be here and to talk to you again tonight. And tonight, uh, I'm talking to you about gravestone lettering in Kansas. And I'd like to begin by asking how many people here have been to Kansas? Oh, wow. Uh, passing through, or? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it, it's part of that country that's kind of known as flyover country. You know, you, you, you fly over it on the way to one of the coasts. Um, anyone here born in Kansas? Oh, okay. Uh, I, I asked because I'm curious about what uh, the perception of a topic like this can be because I'm, I'm talking about gravestone lettering in one region of Kansas. I know it sounds incredibly esoteric and possibly boring. You know, you should have heard me try to explain my research to my relatives in Kansas. They, they struggled to get it. Um, and, and so I, I've been a little defensive about it sometimes. I don't feel like I need to be with you tonight because uh, at least half the topic is about lettering, and I know that all of you here are here because you like letter forms. Um, if you're a little curious about, you know, or, or my question why study cemeteries and gravestones, I, I did bring a little defense, uh, just some quotes by the American anthropologist James Dietz uh, about why we should study gravestones in cemeteries. So I'm just going to uh, read this because it's inspiring for me. Uh, he asked the question, why study cemeteries and grave markers at all? For the same reasons, in essence, that we value and study all artifacts which embody lasting cultural truths to help us achieve a better understanding of ourselves, what we are what we have been, and perhaps what we are in the process of becoming. And this was from an intro of essays uh, he, he edited about uh, gravestones and uh, cemeteries and grave markers. And then he also said this great line about cemeteries, that they are outdoor, spatially delineated repositories of cultural artifacts, which is a kind of wordy uh, way of saying, uh, ex expressing how interesting cemeteries are. And as I was doing research on these, these gravestones in Kansas, I came to see cemeteries as sort of outdoor museums as well. Um, and then lastly, he said that uh, there, in the world of gravestone studies, which does exist, uh, there has been an overemphasis on New England materials, especially you know, all the, the sort of early colonial headstones that we're familiar with, with the great skulls and cherubs with winged wings on either side of their heads. And, uh, and he says, often to the exclusion of other regions of the country. So by looking at Kansas, I kind of feel like I'm representing another, another region of the country that sometimes gets overlooked, especially the Midwest. So this is the, the title of my talk tonight, Not Dead But Sleepeth, and it is a rubbing of a grave marker in a little town called Conway Springs in Kansas. And I say grave marker because it was actually a metal tombstone. It's not a grave stone itself. And I chose it because it, uh, to me, it represents some, some of the tension I feel in doing this kind of research. And that is a, a tension between doing a history of letter forms, which uh, I feel obliged to do because I'm in the design world and this is what I've studied. And that's sort of a tracing of the sources of letter forms and uh, the evolution of letter forms. So that's, that's sort of one way of, of approaching this study of gravestone lettering. And then there's a way of looking at this stuff that is more 
sort of as a historian who happens to like lettering and sees them as a valuable source of information about culture. And I keep going back and forth between the two, and I'll do a little bit of that tonight. And um, so I, 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 this, to me, captured both of those things. I, I made the rubbing because I like the letters. They're not especially spectacular. I probably made the rubbing more because I like the phrase and what it says about ideas about death and cultural sort of evolution of ideas about death. And it's a very poignant phrase, not dead but sleepeth, not dead but sleeping. Someone's not actually dead, um, but just sort of resting somewhere, waiting to come back awake. And there's a lot you can say about that that I find fascinating. Uh, the French historian Philippe Ariès said this is the most ancient, the most constant way to talk about death when we talk about death as a sort of temporary rest or a sleeping. And then other historians have talked about this idea of death as sleep being more of a 19th century American way of softening the tragedy of death, uh, this great unknown that we all have to face, this great mystery. So uh, I, I, I think it's just a, a very revealing phrase. And um, I might talk a little lightly about death tonight, but I, I think that, uh, and, and I'm aware that a lot of people find it a difficult thing to talk about, but that's just my enthusiasm about the subject. Uh, I'm aware that it is, it's a very weighty topic. Uh, I'd like to give a little bit more explanation how, why I'm talking about this region, why I talk about Kansas, and that's purely personal. It's because my father's family is from Kansas. And this all started by seeing interesting gravestones in a cemetery that contains some family graves. So this is the, uh, heads the gravestone for my great-grandfather, Ben Klaus. And it's in a little town in uh, south-central Kansas called Waterloo that's barely a town anymore. It's on one website, it's listed as a ghost town. And this is a rather large stone near the gate of this cemetery. And I'm not presenting it as an example of good lettering. Um, just establishing my connection to Kansas. But also, it's another example, I think, of this bigger history of culture that's represented in the language on these stones. On the stone, it says, Annie lay me by the gate. Annie was his wife. And there I will wait for you, Lily and George, which were his two children. And it, it sort of starts sweetly, and then it seems a little creepy <laughs> when you get to the end. It's almost as if he wants to hurry the process along, you know, and uh, can't wait to see them. Um, but what's really uh, nice about that to me is that he's this man from Ohio, this German-American from Ohio, who comes into Kansas when it's still really kind of rough country and establishes a, a fairly prosperous family farm. And here he, he's dying before his family, and you get a sense that he has again sort of gone ahead into the unknown, into this land beyond death, where he will again sort of prepare a place for them uh, when they are ready to join him. Um, so, uh, just for a little bit more context of why I'm talking about Kansas, this is my, uh, my father's family in the, the late 1930s. So the whole family went to get baptized on the same day together. And my father is one of the little children down there in the front. And my grandfather is the tall man back on the, your right who dies in the 50s when a tractor turns over on him. And so, Tonight I'm looking at gravestones from the 1870s and 80s, and to give you, just place that a little bit more in time, that would have been his great-grandfather's generation, people who were born around the beginning of the 19th century and then die in the 1870s and 80s. Uh, as far as I know now of the, the family, only one of them is left alive now. And so back to this little cemetery in Waterloo, um, another I think culturally significant aspect of American cemeteries is their actual landscape. Uh, it's, it's fascinating, and there's actually, I think, more about the landscape design of American cemeteries than the things in the cemeteries. This is a typical rural American cemetery in the Midwest. It's this plot of land that's been sort of set aside outside of town somewhere, and often landscaped quite nicely. It was in the 19th century, these were places you were meant to go and spend some time and think about life and death, and uh, they were meant to be pretty scenic places. I think what looks perhaps scenic now, uh, probably in the 19th century, looked a lot more bare and barren. Uh, it had a fence right down the middle, Protestants on one side, Catholics on the other. The fences since come down. 
And if you wanted to spend time there uh, and had to go to the bathroom, that's a little outhouse there. That's what that building is there. No one uses it anymore. Um, so what had happened was I long ago visited this cemetery with, with family, and my family stones don't, didn't look very good. But I had this vague memory of, of seeing some stones that reminded me of, of the print design I was studying at the time when I was working on the book, the handy book. And so rather impulsively last winter, I went back to Kansas in the bitter, bitter cold to check out my memory and see if it was good. And yes, there were interesting stones in this cemetery. These were two of them that had a complexity of, of lettering and ornament, scale, um, the variety of lettering styles, and the shaping of, of lines of, of lettering that I remembered and still found interesting. And these are two examples of those. Um, and here's a close-up of another one in that, that photographed on that same day with this kind of lettering in particular that I noticed that had these different layers. Uh, the, and they're, they're very nicely formed le uh, letters that are beveled in and then have a raised rim. And I was just impressed by the, the, the quality of it, uh, especially out here in the middle of nowhere in Kansas. Sorry, this is a little slow. There we go. Oh, back one. And then here's a detail of that, that one stone I showed earlier that shows this, this name sort of being put into a shape that's defined by these curls. And that certainly was reminiscent to me of the print design I had been studying and writing about with Angela. And this is the book that we, the cover of the book we produced out of that um, research, the Handy Book of Artistic Printing. And on the right is a sample of the letterpress printing from that book, one of the wackier examples. And uh, this, if, if you don't know much about artistic printing, just quickly, it's a kind of really elaborate letterpress printing that was meant to impress, uh, impress upon the client or, uh, yeah, I guess mostly the, the clients that uh, these printers could do all kinds of things with, with metal type and ornament that you didn't think they could do. So all of that over there is built out of metal type and rules that have been bent into all kinds of fancy shapes. And it's full of ornament that's very typical of the, the larger aesthetic movement. So I certainly did see a relationship after going back to Kansas between this kind of design, print design and type, and what I was seeing on these stones. So uh, when I looked closely at these stones, I, I didn't even know in the 19th century that a lot of uh, 19th century gravestone carvers signed their work. And at the bottom of one of the better stones was this very clear signature for this company called Kimberly and Adams in Wichita, Kansas. And so uh, I decided, well, I'm going to find out as much as I can about them. So that's what this, this next section is, uh, a background, historical background on this company. Who, who bothered to do this? And this rubbing here is from one of the better or fancier signatures I found on a stone later and made a rubbing of. And one of the first things I found was this great photo of this Kimberly and Adams shop in Wichita in the early 1870s. And this is a fairly well-known photo if you're into Wichita history. Um, and it's a great photo. Wichita is a really young city. It's only incorporated in 1870. Railroads don't reach it until 1872. And this is, this is from that time, and it's from the heart of Wichita. This is downtown Wichita. The road here is a sea of mud. The sidewalk is a wooden sidewalk. And the shop itself that's turning out this fairly complex work is basically a wooden shed with this, this big flat front, which we associate with Western towns, you know, Western movies, uh, that gives you the impression it's a bigger building than it is. And it also gives you this nice big surface for great lettering. So a, to a closer look at the left side of that photo is here. And uh, there's some interesting things going on here. There's some disreputable characters down there in the front, <laughs> hanging around. Um, what else? Uh, the, the lettering is really distracting and, and wonderful for me. I, and I'm very curious about the relationship between the, the sign painters and the lettering being done in, in these western towns and the lettering being done on the gravestones. And if one or two people, I've, I've run into actually only one reference to this in academic literature, um, who, someone who said that very early 
grave markers in the, more in the far west, which were often painted on wood, might have been done by sign painters. But I don't see many direct connections between the lettering on, on these uh, store signs and the lettering on gravestones. But there was probably some back and forth. There were almost always sign painter businesses in these towns. Um, so you've got the, all the signage here uh, and sign painting. And that the name of the business was actually the Wichita Marble Works which you can see sticking out over the sidewalk. Uh, you, what you're seeing uh, in behind the windows are some of the popular shapes of gravestones at the time, especially on the left. You can see a really tall obelisk, and the obelisk is kind of the signature gravestone shape in the, at this time, and much, much sort of commented on in sort of general design histories and architectural histories of the 19th century. And it's a rather tall obelisk, and again, uh, others have written about the variety of forms in 19th century cemeteries, and usually the higher, the better, the, the grander you were. Um, there are other shapes here. The urn, uh, that's a familiar shape. If you look on the right-hand side, you basically see the marble yard itself, where there are random pieces of marble sort of stored that would have been shipped in probably from Kansas City or St. Louis. Uh, there's a wagon back there to carry the pieces. And then there's this funny advertising structure just sort of sitting on the, the wooden sidewalk, and on the top of which you can actually see the name of the proprietor, Christian Kimmerly. And what's interesting is nowhere does the signage mention gravestones, because in the, these early Western towns, businesses had to do a little bit of everything. And what he's really in the business of here is selling building materials. So uh, you can see there he's advertising lime from Hannibal, Missouri hair, plaster, cement, and cut stone. So he basically would have probably made anything you wanted or given you any kind of building material you wanted. And then here's the photo in the background of a display at the local his, his, historical museum, Wichita Historical Museum, um, actually behind one of the Kimberly and Adams stones uh, that has the lettering on it that I was attracted to. So it gives you a sense of the importance of, the, the, of him in the community. Start poking around a little bit more and ran into old ads for the company that sort of repeat the impression that they did a lot of things, a lot of different things. They didn't just do monuments and gravestone. Uh, this, is, this ad says that they were manufacturing dealers in monuments, tombstones, mantles, tabletops, iron fencing, building stone, lime, hair, plaster, and cement. But the image, they, the, the product they picture actually are their gravestones. And again, just to give you a sense, uh, this is a, an ad in a city directory from about the same time, uh, and it's a related business in the middle there, an undertaker's business, who is also dealing in a variety of things. He's also a dealer in sewing machines, needles, oils, etc. cetera. And I, I've wondered if he's dealing in these sort of sewing supplies because he's either sewing up bodies or shrouds, uh, and that might be why he was well stocked in those things. And then this is the man himself, photos I found in the local historical society. This is Christian Kimberly, um, younger and older. I don't know what the outfit is he's wearing on the left. I would assume it's some kind of fraternal order he might have been a member of, which is very common at the time. So he's born in 1845 in Germany in the area of Württemberg. He's the youngest child of a fairly large family. He's apprenticed as a stonemason in Germany. And so when he comes here through Newark, he already has skills, and that's pretty typical of, of a lot of German immigrants. So uh, when he eventually makes it to Kansas, he first starts working as a stonemason on the Kansas State House in Topeka. And then in about 1870, after he, he marries a, another German, he comes to Wichita. And he starts this marble business, but I get a sense that he wasn't sort of a dedicated lettering craftsman. He was just a dedicated entrepreneur and moneymaker because he also owned a couple of saloons. He owned uh, real estate later that he developed and uh, rented for his stores in West Wichita, kind of the wild part of town. And then later he moves to California where he starts other businesses. So remember the business name is a partnership, Kimberly and Adams. I don't know much about the Adams ex guy except he's from West Virginia. And I think he maybe wasn't so prosperous because he, the records of his his uh, living quarters tend to be a lot of rooming houses in wet West Wichita, which again was not the greatest part of town. So if you're a little blurry or soft on your Midwestern geography, 
Here's a map of the center of the country. That's Wichita and Green, I mean, Kansas and Green right in the middle of the, of the map there. Uh, you'll notice this is an old map. This is 1867, so Oklahoma is still called the Indian Territory. And Wichita isn't even on the map yet. It would be right about here. And uh, eventually when Wichita does get there, it's kind of a nothing little place, just a few thousand people. And then the railroad reaches it. And it becomes what's known as a, it became known as a cow town because these big cattle trains would come up through Texas and Oklahoma to the railhead there at Wichita. And because of the transient nature of that kind of work and the reputation of cowboys, it was kind of a, a wild west kind of town at the time. So it had a kind of a racy reputation. But that kind of settles down eventually as the railroad expands and cattle trains sort of decline. It's a rather, the cattle train period is a rather brief period. Uh, a few more, a couple more images of Wichita from the 1870s. This is a great one. I, because of the signage, I really love the diamond grocery store here, the facade of the black and white diamonds. And then um, in the back over here, you can see W.C. Woodman. He was a prominent early citizen who started a bank in Wichita that, um, and eventually commissioned uh, some statuary from Kimberly and Adams, a statue of a lion and a dog to decorate his bank. I find that really interesting because the skills to do that kind of in the round sculpture is really pretty rare at the time. If you got those kinds of sculptures, say for memorials, they probably came from Vermont or Italy. Uh, but it's the, the article I read about that made it sound as if they were actually carved there in Wichita. Another sign, uh, example of great uh, sign painting going on, this is the Wichita Carriage Works, and then uh, with this great sort of constructed Gothic shadow lettering, and then just an, the inset here is of an ad for a sign painter, a typical ad for a O.B. Lawrence house carriage ornamental and sign painter, paper hanging, bronzing, and graining. So he also did a little bit of everything. Wichita today is a fairly small city. It's about 390,000 people. It's had its ups and downs economically. Um, very dependent on the aerospace industry. A uh, very affordable place to live. Uh, and I spent two weeks there this summer uh, visiting a lot of cemeteries. But I started in the oldest, largest cemetery I could find in Wichita, which is Highland Cemetery, which has a great number of 19th century stones. And I went there blind, not knowing what I'd find, hoping to find more designs by Kimberly and Adams. And sure enough, there were a lot of them, and a lot that looked like them, that were unsigned or signed by other people. So I got a sense of a general style during the time. The one on the right is not signed by them, but I think it's probably them. And I loved the fact that it's got all the lettering I liked, and then the, the column of lettering shifts off so it's asymmetric and makes room for the fern ornaments, which are typical sort of funerary ornament at the time. And then on the left, I was really pleased to find this really grand memorial to a prominent family that was signed by uh, a J. Kimberly. And this is a, a memorial to the Mathewson family, which helped found Wichita and the William Matheson was known as Buffalo Bill. Not the Wild West show Buffalo Bill, but someone else who made a name killing buffaloes and supplying meat to the US Army. And he ended up shooting the last buffalo around Wichita in the 1890s. It was basically in a pen, and he pointed a rifle at it and <laughs> shot it. Uh, so uh, uh, he had a couple of wives, and they're all, they're all sort of represented here. And Kimberly and Adams did lettering on those cartouches at the base. So I decided to hit the road in Kansas, much of which looks like this. And uh, just, I wanted to get a sense of how substantial and prosperous a business like this was. And also, how far rural people in the 19th century would go to find and buy a really, really nice sort of letter, well-lettered sort of gravestones. And so this is a map of my travels uh, with Wichita in the middle, where I saw the most, the greatest number of, of Kimberly and Adams stones and then the little black graves are all the other ones I found in small towns. I visited a, around 20 rural cemeteries and saw a total of 59 stones that were signed by Kimberly and Adams or one of the other members of the Kimberly family. Most of them seem to be in the south and west of Wichita. Um, and there's not much you'll notice east of Wichita. I don't know what that means economically. 
I basically ran out of time. Uh, this is not a very scientific sort of uh, survey or archaeological survey. I did not walk every cemetery row by row because I started to just look for white obelisks. And I certainly did not hit every cemetery in the area. But it was a lot of fun traveling around uh, to all these small towns. And a lot of these, these cemeteries are, again, these classic rural lawn or garden cemeteries surrounded by fencing and often with sort of nice uh, ornate gates, iron gates, like this one in Argonia, Kansas. And this was a favorite uh, small cemetery called Smoky Hill Cemetery at the base of an outcropping in Kansas called Coronado Heights that offered some great views of the countryside. So now I'd like to take a closer look at the lettering itself that fascinated me. And I started to see the same things over and over again and needed a way to talk about them. So I came up with some names for the different lettering styles I was seeing. And the, all of these are meant to show the, this kind of uh, rimmed sans serif letter that I was first attracted to. Uh, it's off, they're often the center parts in each image. And I started just calling that Chameleon Adams Sands or K&A Sands because I didn't know what else to call it. And these letters often appeared in arcs or, or angles, often in boxes. And one of the reasons that you see that over and over again is because the obelisk is the trendy popular shape at the time. And it's a rather narrow shape to get some often long names on there at any sort of scale. So what do you do? You sort of curve it and you put, it weird, put the name at weird angles to fit onto these narrow obelisks like, like this one in Belle Plaine, Kansas. And uh, this was actually one of the more elaborate chameleon atom stones I, I did see, a, a draped obelisk. But all, not, these weren't all obelisks, though, and sometimes it seemed like the arc was just more of a habit than a necessity, such as, as this stone in Cheney, Kansas, that, where the name could have been split or it could have been in more of a condensed kind of letter form but um, you got it in the arc again. One of the uh, other letters that I was attracted to and, and saw over and over again was this, this letter form that uh, is vaguely like a fat face and has this deeply carved shadow underneath each character. And I just started calling it K&A shadow. It's probably no most noticeable on the image on the lower right there. This was a stone that had broken off and become embedded in the ground and was more worn than most of them. And so the shadows end up being these, these crescents under each letter and even the periods and the semicolons. There's a kind of uh, Roman letter form that I just call K&A fat face, although it's not a true fat face because it has a lot more sort of swishes and ornaments coming off of the letter forms. But uh, some of the, the numbers especially, like the sevens, are, are really great. They get really, really chunky and almost illegible. Um, and uh, so those, those reminded me more of a fat face. That, so that was my easy name for that, that style. Then there's a, a style I call Canon or Cumulian Adams Tuscan, which uh, was a little bit more rare. This was usually large at the bottom of a, of a stone, and it's the family name. And it's a lot like that K&A Sands, that other rimmed letter but with Tuscan ends, broken ends on the, uh, the letters, and uh, often surrounded by kind of delicate boxes of ornament. But probably the, the words and the, the, the letters that intrigued me the most were those that were like the standard part of the formula. So I said I'm seeing the same thing over and over again on these stones. I've seen the same lettering styles, but also the same language, basically it's a name, Maybe there's some kind of a, a relationship established, like on this one, the wife of Samuel, Samuel Wolf, then uh, the date they died and their age. And those, those little words, died, aged, wife of, because they're like parts of a standard formula, there's the most variety of, uh, in, in design appears in those, those words. And, for example, and I did lots of rubbings of those. For example, here's a really nice shadowed born and a wife of that gets really, really expressive with these curls coming and swashes coming off of the letters. And then um, the dyes. So I did a lot of rubbings of that word uh, because there was such variety in them. Um, all lowercase, all uppercase, uh, um, 
with flourishes, surrounded by ornament in boxes, reversed out in boxes. Um, really, really fantastic variety. And in general, I did some other rubbings as well. And, and here's one I just include here to show how these sort of standard words, died and aged, are fit fairly well into a, a, this complex little arrangement of letters uh, uh, on a stone for Luc Lucretia F. Um, and uh, everything here seems kind of exaggerated and, and plump, the, 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 the shadows and the, the weight of the letters. Just a few examples of some of the more uh, interesting and appealing letter forms I found that weren't by Kimberly and Adams. Uh, for instance, this was a stone in Hutchinson, Kansas. And uh, this is just, I took this photo to document the rubbing process. But at this point, I'd run out of the nice black cemetery rubbing wax and the nice cemetery rubbing paper. So this is the red wax on butcher paper. But there was something so appealing I had to make do here. There's something so appealing about the lettering on this stone. And it had a kind of particularly uh, entrancing uh, naive quality. It felt more like folk art lettering than the more polished things I was seeing from Kimberly and Adams. And I thought it was also interesting that those stock words died are almost identical here, but different scales, which suggests to me that they're being traced from some sort of stock pattern book or from other stones and then just being scaled up and down. I almost never saw Tuscan uh, uh, letters in, small, in smaller parts of the, the lettering on, on tombstones, uh, gravestones. But uh, here's an example of one. This is actually the gravestone that has not dead but sleepeth on one of the other sides. And it's cast metal. It's called white bronze. It's from a company in Connecticut. And the, the, the small name on, on the stone, on this face of the, of the, of the grave marker, Grace E, is a, a nice Tuscan letter. And then here's another one, the word mother. And I think these weren't carved very often simply because they were probably more difficult to do. The most fantastic example of uh, orna ornamented sort of lettering I saw on a gravestone is this name, R.M. Morris. Unfortunately, the sun was going down and the cemetery was about to close and I didn't have much light. And this was the best photograph I could get. But it was the only time I saw letters like this in the name that were split down the middle. The bottom half is carved more deeply. The top half is, is shallow. And that looks, uh, it, they're basically doing a three-dimensional version of a lot of the, the, the metal and wood type and uh, engraved lettering uh, of the, the same period. It's the only time I saw someone attempt to do this. Um, so I talked about you know, two ways to sort of look at this work and the, kind of the, the tension I feel in doing this kind of research between Okay, let's focus on the letters and the history of the letters themselves and where do these forms come from. And then the entrancing sort of language of the, this on the stones themselves. And my best guide to that kind of thinking about the language and the context was this book uh, by the French historian Philippe Perriez, The Hour of Our Death. And it's a big, substantial book. Uh, it's been called magisterial. Um, I, it is. I would say it's also a bit rambling. But uh, it, it's really a good guide to the bigger story, the bigger history of what's on these on gravestones anywhere. And I liked this phrase he had called the epigraphic literature, which is just his term for the language that develops on gravestones. And uh, this list right here is his list of what epigraphic literature is. There's the notice of identity. Who is this? The appeal to the passing stranger, which you do see on some of these stones, and it's basically um, an, a request to passers-by that they pray for whoever is buried there, or it's maybe some sort of message to them like, as I am now, you soon will be, or something like that. Um, a, the pious formula, number three in that list there, is uh, some sort of standard prayer or sort of devotional or religious phrase, and many of these stones in Kansas have that as well. The rhetorical development, uh, there's a period when there, these grave markers and inscriptions on graves get rather wordy, describing the wonders of the person buried there. And then lastly, the, the inclusion of the family, which is something that Arias says 
doesn't occur until sort of after the 15th century. So it's interesting to me that on, on so many of the stones, especially for women in Kansas, you see the establishment of the relationship between her and other people. You don't see it so much on stones for men. It's almost as if female, stones for women uh, had to be justified in some way, that, that her existence had to be justified. Here was Margaret, wife of Samuel Wolfe, or she might have been mother or daughter of so-and-so. And, and that is part of the epigraphic literature that Arias mentions. Um, and I, I thought it was just interesting to think of that as a fairly recent development in history of inscriptions, but also as uh, some, saying something about uh, gender, gender idea, the history of gender in uh, 19th century Kansas. And here are some more examples of that. Uh, these are all rubbings I made. They weren't Kimberly and Adam stones, but I just thought they were great. But the two on the, the, the left one and the center one are both for women, and they both explain that this, uh, these ladies were the wives of someone. So Batty Mae Parvin is the wife of G.A. Stevens. She died when she was 22. Lizzie E. was the wife of E.B. Nicholson. But then on the right there is Frank, and uh, Frank Daly or Bally, um, who is who does not have any explanation of his relationship to anybody. It's almost as if he didn't, didn't need one. And then uh, lastly, there's this, uh, when I talk about epigraphic literature, uh, Arias mentions the, he talks about this description of the date, the biographical information. And one thing you see in so many 19th century, on so many 19th century stones, is this very, very meticulous record keeping of how old this person was, in this case, 51 years, one month, and five days. And since we've lost that, I think it's particularly fascinating to us, a little bit humorous, like who cares how many days they lived. And the only person I've seen comment on this is Arias, who says this down here, that this very careful re record keeping corresponds to a more statistical conception of human existence in which life is defined more by its length than by its content, a conception which is that of our bureaucratic and technological civilization. Arias is writing this in the 1980s, and uh, it's, if you think that uh, now we live in an even more, even from when he was writing it, even, even more technological civilization, but have lost that, I kind of wonder what that means about uh, gravestone inscription now, or, or our lack of interest in recording the length of one's life so minutely. When you're doing this kind of uh, research, I think one of the classic things you're looking for is the sources of, say, the letter forms in this case, and the influences. And this was particularly difficult when looking at gravestone lettering to find, in, in one's mind, and say in my mind, I always imagined I'd find the lettering book that made it to Kansas in the 1870s that Kimberly and Adams were copying, that this was the source for the letters, but I've never found such a thing. And not many people have written about 19th century gravestone lettering. Here on the right is the cover of one book that does a little bit. Um, this is a small book by the Englishman Alan Bartram called Tombstone Lettering in the British Isles. It's a rather, I think, cranky book. It's entertaining for that reason. <laughs> but he basically travels throughout England commenting very acidly on, on the different lettering styles he sees. And he does mention the that he thinks some of the stones he looks at reflect the influence of print design on the inscriptions and the inscription styles. And this is one of the stones where he says that is the case. He, these are, are his black and white photographs. And you, you can see, he's saying that basically this lettering style is influenced by Victorian playbills, the complexity of those where every line had to be different sizes, different type styles. Um, different lengths, the variety, what was, what was valued. And certainly you can see that, that here somewhat. And um, here's another example of that. He said that this stone as well showed the influence of Victorian playbill printing design. And then on the, the right there are some examples of playbills from the same time period. And I think what you'll notice though is that the playbills actually have a, a lot, uh, they're bolder and, and they're, they're lacking 
some of the fine lines and swashes and decoration of the stones. So I think there's also a relationship between the lettering on these English stones and engraving. And so that's, that's why I show down at the bottom there a bill head, an engraved billhead from England as well, where you can see more of the overlapping of ornament and, and letters and really fine sort of scripts as well. So what do I think were the influences or the sources of the letters on these Kansas stones? In the, the desire to show dimension, like you see in the, the letters that I'm calling KNA Sands, those indented, rimmed letters in that arc there, I do see re, uh, a reflection of the desire in metal type and, and some print design to show dimension. And it, so I'm a little bit reminded of Relievo 1 and Relievo number 2 from McKellar, Smith and Jordan, metal type that's issued in the 1870s. And also a style of printing called, uh, sometimes called ga the gaslight style. So that's an example on the right there. And it's called that because the heavily, often heavily shadowed letters uh, perhaps suggest the light cast on shop signs or uh, constructed uh, signs uh, by gaslight. And uh, I, I do think there, there, there's some relationship there, more between, not literally in the letter forms, but between the desire to show dimension and the, the, the dimension sort of created in these, these carved letters on the left. But I think the, the biggest proof of this relationship of dimensional lettering on gravestones to print design is because it just doesn't make sense. When you can actually carve a letter that casts a real shadow, like these on the right, why, why carve a fake shadow? You know, that's why I think that what they're doing in the carving the fake shadow is basically imitating print design. Um, because it, it might have been a, a little harder to say carve what's on the right there, because you've got to carve more away. But you would have gotten a real shadow. Um, and so why carve a fake one? In the ornament as well, on these stones, uh, I see a relationship to print design of the time. There, here's an example of artistic printing down here in the lower left that uses a lot of these corner fills. And on some of the stones, you certainly see those, like the one on the, the right there. And then on the, the one on the top, that stone has been recently renovated where all the low parts were filled with black paint or ink to make them stand out more. And then also I see a relationship to artistic printing in the fine sort of decorations that are put around some of the words and letters, like the, the Hoff down here. Um, it reminds me of artistic printing work, like the little ad on the top, where there's all these lines are outlined again and again in very delicate ornament. I think there's also a relationship between this gravestone lettering and wood type. Um, so here's what I was calling K&A Sands, and then here's a page from a Hamilton Manufacturing Company uh, catalog page. And the catalog page is actually a little later than this sample of gravestone lettering. But, uh, and so I can't really say which direction the influence is going, but uh, there's obviously uh, a common, sort of common sources or common thinking between the two things. And then the, the dyed, and those other sort of standard words, wife of, um, born, um, aged, remind me of the logotypes you could buy in wood type catalogs, like this page from um, the, the page wood type catalog, where you can buy these ats, ofs, ands, fors, um, already sort of made into a nice shape. I wouldn't be surprised if some of those dyes were also in some sort of catalog somewhere, or were gathered by someone somewhere as a group of, of things that you could try. And of course, I think there were other sort of, probably more professional than we, than we can imagine. So there are other community discussions about design and art going on among memorial designers and carvers. And I haven't found much about that except remnants of, and ads in some of the trade journals. For instance, on the top here, you could buy a portfolio case of memorial designs and copy them if you wanted or be inspired by them. 
Down the lower left is an ad that says, a good design is half the battle, and you could buy watercolor and airbrush illustrations and memorials from an artist in Chicago. And then on the lower right, someone is selling photographs uh, and ne are negatives of the most artistic monuments in the principal American cemeteries that you could use for inspiration. So, and this is, this is the 1880s and 1890s, so people are thinking about design and sharing design. And then, of course, there are alphabet books designed specifically for engineers and draftsmen. And um, there, were, there were several of these. This is the famous Ames alphabet, which goes through many editions. Uh, it's in New York. This one's 1884. But I have not been able to see many of these. They're often hard to find. And also, uh, uh, pictures of them, uh, photographs that I've seen of the pages do not lead me to make many connections between the lettering in these and the stones I've seen in Kansas. Here's the cover of one from New York that actually says it's uh, ornamental penmen, engravers, sign writers, and stone cutters, pocketbook of alphabets. So it's specifically aimed at stone cutters. Also, in some of the trade manuals, uh, there would be sections on lettering because they knew lettering was important and you would get uh, samples of alphabets that you could trace for your work in your shop. You'd get like half the alphabet in one issue and then you had to wait for the, the next issue to get the rest of the alphabet. And some of these are really charming, but again, I have not found direct connections between these and the stones I'm seeing in Kansas. Um, here is a particularly strange one, up through P. And then later in the teens and the 20s and 30s, the marble companies start to provide more for the monument companies. Uh, so they actually published quite a bit uh, about good design for monuments. And there was one book from the Vermont Marble Company in Vermont, which was an enormous company, on lettering. Uh, but the, the styles are too young for me, but I still show some of the pages to show that people were thinking about design quite a bit. Uh, of, of memorials, and I actually like some of the pages as well. This is just called Commercial Gothic. And uh, here was a page of something just called Script, which is pretty nice. In thinking about sources and influences, uh, I also have to ask, what were the effects of national identity of the men doing the work? Christian Kimberly is German, so you'd think maybe there's some design influence from Germany, again, I've not been able to find that. Um, and not that I've gone to Germany to look at cemetery stones, but I've tried to find what I can online. Um, there, there are cemeteries in Kansas uh, that are known for the design, German cemeteries that are known for the design of their grave markers, and that's what the photo is of on the left there. There were Germans who came to Kansas from the Volga River region of Russia. They're known as Volga Germans, who had a particular kind of grave marker design style, these iron filigree crosses. They're Catholics, and the, these crosses are very distinctive. And so these, these grave markers and cemeteries are, are rather well known. Uh, of course, that's not what Kimberly and Adams are doing. And then uh, just a bit more nationalism on the left is a stone from the little town of Lindsberg, a very Swedish town in Kansas. And the language uh, there is actually in Swedish on the stone. And it, it, but style-wise, design-wise, it's basically a, sort of a vernacular version of what Kimberly and Adams are doing in Wichita. This is far, pretty far north of Wichita. And then finally, when talking about sources and influences, you, in the, the bigger context, you can't ignore what's going on in the economy in Kansas at the time. And that's what this image is about. I've got two images here. One is of the Kimberly House, Christian Kimberly's house, uh, in the early 1870s on the left there, just to show you that his biz he was a good businessman. He did well. Um, but it was a boom time in Kansas when quite a few people were making a good deal of money. His house is one of the first substantial houses in Wichita. And then I just want to show that image on the right again to show that some families, again, could kind of show their success and prosperity uh, with a rather grand memorial like this one for the Matheson family. The best record I've, description of these, this period in Wichita that I found is by a young woman named Rhea Woodman who wrote a book called Wichitana. And she described both the boom in, in Wichita in the 1880s and then the bust. It, things really go bad, really go south. 
So I just want to read you her description to give you a sense of the kinds of people who would have been buying this lettering and these stones. Uh, so she writes of the 1880s um, that by 1880, the typical worst was over. She means the pioneer worst, the days when they were Indians wandering around downtown Wichita and children. She herself was kidnapped by Indians and her father went out into the, the country and found her. Um, all that's over by 1880 and there were lots more of us and we had more things. We picked up an interest in household garniture, tidies, throws, lambrequins, crocheted mats. We had more and better grammar. Lines of social demarcation began to be traced faintly here and there, an almost imperceptible effort to put on dog being noticeable on certain avenues and in certain neighborhoods. We were still tentative and wistful and believing and still modest in a polka dotted sort of way, but the corroding elements of comparison and domestic competition had entered. There were rich families, poor families, and yellow dog families, and all suffering alike from an internal itch to get on, to emulate somebody who was trying to catch up with somebody else, who was in turn trying to catch up with somebody else. So I, I just think that captures a sense of social mobility that perhaps is influencing the desire for someone 50 miles away from Wichita to have a really nice tombstone that they would order from Cumulene Adams. And then the last bit there, in contrast, in the 1890s, quote, Wichita was going through a period of profound and general depression. It was knee deep in the morass that extended from the boom of 1886, 87. What happened was there was a big real estate bubble, one of the biggest in this country's history, when people were buying up land in Wichita like crazy, and then it just crashed. Um, and then at the, at the end of it here, her quotes are, it was a period of old clothes and tax receipts and the fashionable way to make one's exit from Wichita in the 90s was the unpaid tax route, which is kind of a reference to some of the old trails like the Oregon Trail that you know, led you west. But here it was when you couldn't pay your taxes, you sold what you could and you got out of town, which she and her family had to do. Uh, so uh, it's a poignant uh, description, I think, of Wichita at the time. So that, that, that crash in Wichita basically ends Chameleon Adams. I, I, the, the reference to it, references to it start to fade away in the 1890s. And uh, I think uh, the Adams family, <laughs> that sounds funny, the Adamses move back to West Virginia and Kimberly himself looks for other business opportunities. Uh, a little bit about um, technology. I, I feel like I should talk a little bit about how some of this work was done to understand it better. And when you start looking at the sources of the materials themselves, you end up back in Vermont, usually, or somewhere in the east. Marble came from other places like Georgia and Kentucky, but most of the marble um, used for all kinds of architectural elements and gravestones at the time comes out of Vermont, the area around Rutland, Vermont. So this is a photograph of the Vermont Marble Company yards in Rutland, Vermont in the 1870s. And they had sales representatives in St. Louis and Kansas City, which is where a lot of the marble in Wichita would have come from. It's still a handcraft at this time, and this is from a manual of marble working in the 1860s showing the range of tools that a typical marble cutter would need. Lots and lots of different kinds of chisels and calipers and measuring devices and a good sturdy bench. And then this is a later photo from the 20th century, but I think it shows basically what they were doing a lot of the time in the 19th century, which is carefully chiseling away letters. But I do not think uh, that, this, th that these, these letters specifically, the ones I'm calling K and A sands, the ones in the arc there, were carved. I think those were probably etched away by acid, which is what, what it, that was being done at the time, because the letters are just too perfect and too regular, and then you've got these, this layering going on, the different levels that I think would have been very hard to keep flat. I might be underestimating the craftsmen at the time, but uh, I have read a description in that same manual, the tools came from, that there was a kind of acid etching that was going on at the time. Eventually, uh, the, the, all the technology changes in the way these things get carved, and you go from a kind of careful sort of handcraft, whether it was acid etching or carving, to pneumatic drills and sandblasting. And that happens, that transition happens in the 1890s. So that's a sandblasting booth there on the left. And on the right, I, it's a particularly amusing photo to me, 
it shows an invention by a couple of brothers to hook up a pneumatic drill to a car engine so you could just drive your car into the cemetery and, and do the work on the spot right there. And then here's another illustration from a, a manual, uh, a guide to monument makers of, and a section about letters and lettering when pneumatic drills have already become widespread and this shows how a, a tank of carbonic gas can be used to power a pneumatic drill right in the cemetery. And then there's a big change in materials. Uh, the stone itself, marble is basically abandoned because it's too soft. And in the 1890s, there's a transition in the whole profession or the whole field of memorial uh, design to granite because it's much, much harder, which also still can come from Vermont. Um, but uh, so that, that made it easy for me when I was looking for the stones I was interested in to always look for the white stones, the marble stood out. Um, this is a photograph of a sample yard at a monument company in the town of Winfield. And so most of the stones you're seeing there are types of granite. You could choose your color and your finish and all that. And the young salesperson who I talked to there said they still had a few marble stones for sale, but he never recommended it and they never sold actually because he said marble just melts like butter in, in the climate there. And uh, a lot of the stones um, that I tried to make rubbings of were in bad shape. The, the profession of the monument industry and the, mon the lettering uh, that went along with it was developed enough so that in a trade journal, you could have cartoons poking fun at lettering problems, such as this. So uh, sorry it's a little soft. These are screen grabs of a, a digital version of this trade journal. But on the left, you're supposed to be seeing some good lettering. And it says, as they thought it would look when they signed the contract. So, uh, and then on the right is what they actually got. So it, it, was sh it shows a sensitivity to what good lettering was and bad lettering. So the mess on the right is definitely supposed to be bad. And then here's another cartoon uh, along the same lines. It's uh, titled Skimpy Lettering. And the, comp the business is called Hurryum and Pushem. And uh, Mr. Hurryum there on the left is saying, you fellows get down to the depots quick with that lead and make the old plug jump. The old plug is the horse in the background. Um, look here, Diego, you've been half a day on that inscription and it's only 40 letters. Just scratch them in and finish the job. Uh, Jimmy, bring the paint pot. I'm not quite sure what that last bit means. I think he means we'll paint these letters in to make them look better. <laughs> so there's, there's, uh, there's a lot of competition in the industry in the 1890s and uh, a lot of scolding writing in these trade journals about like do a good job and be an honorable businessman and, and live up to your contracts and do good lettering. Uh, a little bit more about business. I made a nice discovery in the small town of Winfield, Kansas, the Dawson Monuments Company. And this is the building. It's a very nice sign there on the side. And this is a building that's not owned by the Dawsons anymore, but it traces its, the beginnings back to the uh, late 19th century. And they still had their ledgers, which was fantastic. And they showed them to me. So I was able to see how people ordered gravestones at the time and uh, what they cost. And um, what's interesting, so these are three entries of orders. And what you see is, peop, uh, is the, the monument dealer uh, noting sort of standard symbols that people are getting on their stones. For instance, at the top, that's uh, the order of a stone for a young boy who's less than one when he dies. And he gets a lamb on the left over there. You see a lamb. And then the man below him um, gets, at the end of the, the third line, he gets a dove. So the people just asking for these sort of standard symbols. A lamb was a standard symbol for a uh, children's gravestone. Um, and then you'll see number 188. So there's, there's someone's just choosing a style out of a catalog, probably from a, a marble company. This gives a sense of prices. These things were fairly pricey at the time. Um, I don't know the scale of these stones exactly, but these particular ones. But you're seeing you know, $30, $22. And then I love the line in the middle in the red that says, returned deadbeat. Uh, so someone couldn't pay. And uh, the $65 was quite a lot and basically had to return the stone. And then they got this angry note in the ledger. Uh, one more thing that was of interest in this shop, the Dawson Monument Company, they had a little box of stencils. So this is not 19th century, but I just show it 
because you're lettering people. It's a typeface called Vermarco, which is still widely used today. That was designed by the Vermont Marble Company. And they would send out these little kits of stencils, metal stencils, with which you would punch the letters out of mats that would go over the stones, and then you'd sandblast through the mat and only, you know, only the letters exposed. So they still had their little, this place had their little dusty kit of Vermarco, which is really interesting. Uh, just, we'll end on um, a bit of a description about um, the evolution of a craft. Uh, when you reach the end of the 19th century, it's fascinating. You find the same criticism of the design of the earlier lettering on tombstones, that the same criticism that you see in descriptions of print design from an earlier age. Angela and I have wrote, written, written about this quite a bit. But at the end of the 19th century, everyone hates the really complicated artistic printing. Uh, it's, it's really described in very, put down in very moral sort of language. And I was really glad, uh, happy to find an example of that same sort of thing happening here in an analysis of tombstone lettering. So this is an article showing you, in the middle there, that's an example of what would have been done, an inscription that would have been designed in the, 18th, the end of the 1860s. And then at the bottom is what they're saying is good at the time. So the date of this journal is 1900. So they describe that middle design as, uh, in this day, such an inscription would be considered a crazy jumble of hen scratches, intolerable in the poorest shop in the land. And um, they describe, very, they, they analyze this kind of design with all of its variety of, of type, of, of lettering form, letter forms and uh, line lengths and weights as, as something that was once very, very fashionable but now just seems really, really old fashioned. So down at the bottom, the stuff they're talking about is good. They describe as the best all around letter which always looks well and in the right place is the plain Gothic in different sizes for different purposes and always in capitals for the names, dates, et cetera, the small letter being used only in case a motto or verse is desired. And I, I find these, that, that bottom example, that kind of Gothic lettering is very constructed, very draftsman-like, and very kind of workaday, on a strange looking, uh, but they think it's great. Um, this is a sample, just to bring it up to the present day, so basically, what happens with gravestone inscriptions, companies like McKellar, Smith and Jordan and many, many other small marble companies and gravestone memorial companies in the Midwest go out of business. Uh, eventually, memorial making and manufacturing becomes a, a very big business in this country. And um, you basically have reached a point today where it has all of its own traditions and design styles. So this, this is the these are the lettering sample granite pieces that were in this Dawson Monument Company in Win Winfield, Kansas. And I kind of slyly took a little photo of them while I was there because I'm fascinated by how bad they are, um, how bad the lettering is. Um, you're seeing them still using Vermarco, so that's an example of Vermarco down there at the bottom, which is basically a very art deco letter. So to me, it's, it's, I like it, I'm interested in it, but it seems old fashioned. Um, then you're seeing more in the middle there on the right, art deco sort of styles. Uh, misspelled Flintstone in the, the box up there. Um, and there's this forcing of letters into shapes that they do not fit well, like the open book down here. Um, and, and, and a desire to suggest scrolls and things like that, but again, the lettering is not fit into these things well. They're basically not being done by designers. And this is basically why all over the place in monument lettering and design today. And I spoke to the young man who's the designer and salesperson here, and he, he sort of fell into the job. He has no training in this, and um, he's doing a fine job. What's kind of ironic is that the technology is really, really advanced, so this company is offering things like the ability to laser cut photographs into stones, and he showed me some really very realistic examples of this. Uh, but I think the the design skill behind the craft and the technology is just not there. Also, it's, it's just seen as very expensive to do custom work. So he also showed me the, the big sh some big shaped stones, some angels, that are actually cut in China. <coughs> they're, they're made in China, and it's cheaper even to make these huge blocks of stone and ship them over here than it would be to make them here. And there was just something a little off about that angel, and uh, you know, I just, 
I, 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 <laughs> I just I felt bad that you know these these sort of Western symbols associated with death had to be outsourced <laughs> to, chi to China. Um, and I want to end here by showing you the proof of lettering that I got this summer when my father died. During, during this research, my father died in North Carolina and in the summer, uh, which certainly affected my interest in this, this subject of gravestones in Kansas. Um, he, he was cremated, and uh, his ashes were put into a columbarium in North Carolina. And so basically, the urn is put into a niche that you've bought ahead of time. And along with that contract, your, uh, a, a granite plaque gets uh, in, inscribed with his name and birth and death dates, and that gets put over the niche. And this is, the church handles all that, and this is the proof they sent us, which make me very unhappy <laughs> design-wise. I mean, I just feel like there, there's so much wrong here with the spacing. The, the typeface is not something I, I know. I have a feeling it's some kind of old-fashioned stone cutters, uh, uh, typeface that they just they use for everything and uh, I wish this so much this could be better but we didn't fight it uh, I didn't know how to really uh, you know the church was uh, probably not too open to me giving them a custom design <laughs> um, so I, I end here because I, I, I kind of wanted to end with a challenge to all you lettering and design people there I think there's a a lot of opportunity in memorial design. The, the world of memorial design needs a lot of help, and I think there's a lot of uh, great opportunities out there for new businesses. Uh, especially, imagine, imagine you and your friends someday being old enough to actually pass away, and uh, uh, wanting, wanting a headstone or, or some sort of memorial design, and what, how would you get that? If you go through the current system, you will not end up <laughs> with something you're very happy with unless you keep it as plain as possible. I, I've ha actually designed a memorial marker for some family friends, and I shipped off the, the outline file to Illinois, and then the later, months later, the family sends, proudly sends me a photograph of the finished piece. And they had changed it, in my eyes, completely. Of course, they thought it was exactly the same, but you know, the typeface was different, the spacing was all wrong. And basically, they'd replace, they'd use my design as basically a guide to what they had to, to use. They had to use their equipment and their typefaces. Um, so I would say right now that lettering design for memorials uh, hopefully is, is not dead but sleepeth. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that it can be revived by you and others. Uh, and that's, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Uh, did, do you have time for questions? Should I choose? Okay, Sarah. Uh, yes, there was a lot of this, this strange little, yes, yes, it was very small, and some of those things go on quite long, and they're funny line breaks because the, some of the lines were quite long. Uh, I just, yeah, again, I, I don't know the sources of that. I guess I didn't focus on it because I was looking at the bigger things, the, the flashier things above that, but yeah, there was a lot. Yeah, yeah. There was always. I think that's that's uh, in the epigraphical literature or epigraphic literature. That was the that's the, the religious part. Often that's the, the prayer or the, the the wish for the soul of the deceased. And again, though, those were pretty much stock phrases that probably came out of a little book that the monument dealer had, and someone just chose the one that was most relevant. Yeah, champ.
I did not hear that from anyone in the field, but I've wondered about that as well. One of the things you do read about, uh, there's a, a good book about the history of death in this country, and uh, ideas about death, that mentions the dying of death that's happened over the course of the 20th century. We removed ourselves from it to a greater and greater degree so that I think you can live in a place like Manhattan where there aren't a lot of cemeteries sort of in the landscape. There are a few. And if you live in Queens or Brooklyn, of course, you see them from the expressways. But you're not, you, you know, death is not something you see. You don't see hearses going down the streets or even motorcades uh, that you do in other parts of the country. Um, it's not a big part of our lives, so I don't think many people are thinking about it or um, are retaining many traditions associated with it. So I think many people are getting creative when they die and asking for their ashes to be scattered in unusual places. And, um, that's, yeah, I've wondered about that as well. I think there probably would be some good interviews to do with people in the business. Uh, back there. Hey. Do you get much choice in the design? I don't think so, but it's rather large, right? It's not a tiny little marker. You don't get much. That's great. Wow. So did you do that? Did you? We did. <laughs> we did. It kind of moves around. Every time I see it, it's a different place. I only get there. Yeah. <laughs> So there's a fit, someone, ta our taxpayer dollars are paying somewhere, someone is uh, designing these stones. Okay. Yeah. They often were smaller, and they very often had a lamb on them somewhere. Uh, the more elaborate ones uh, sometimes actually had a little representation of a baby, um, sometimes a spilled uh, bouquet of flowers or a little basket of flowers or other symbols sort of trying to, that are sort of rep to represent a life cut short. Um, but yeah, they were often smaller and had more sort of endearing, sort of heart-wrenching phrases on them, um, our baby or our, our beloved child and things like that. But the lettering styles were the same, generally. Yeah. I was just curious how the title of that uh, lettering manual is one that was for the very first time that you wrote your name in that manual. You had it uh, suggested by Dan, I think. Oh, the one after Ames. After, yeah, the one after. Yeah, um, it was from New York. It was published here in New York. And I'd have to actually go back, which I'll do. I appreciate it. Sure. Uh, this one. Yeah, I thought I had it ordered recently and it was sold out from under me, so I haven't seen one. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I, I wouldn't mind pulling it together somehow. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not sure who would publish it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I'm, uh, I wonder how it would be shaped by an editor. There is something called the Association of Gravestone Studies uh, that focused quite intensely, most, I would say, focused on New England uh, gravestones and cemeteries. Their archives are in Amherst. You know, perhaps they would be interested in, it, in the information. You know. uh, any other questions? Yeah. 
Yes, uh, I have some photos of these on, on my blog. Um, they were close to home here, up just north of the city, near White, uh, was it White Plains? Yeah, near White Plains, um, the town of Hastings, actually. There's a big, very diverse cemetery there. Uh, I can't remember the name of it now. But there was a section of Jewish, modern <coughs> Jewish stones that were really impressive. Um, and stood out because they were so much better than anything else, modern stones I've seen. There was a sense that they'd been custom designed, you know, for a particular person, and they were really interesting. But that's the only place I've seen them. The market is really open. <laughs> yeah, I think the market is really open. For a business, you mean? Yeah, a business yeah. name? Uh, no. <laughs> end point, I don't know, journey's end. No, that's a hotel chain, I think. Uh, <laughs> right, right. Anyone else? Okay, thank you. Thank you.